Hey, what's up, y'all? I'm Dr. Italo Brown, emergency physician, and this is Med vs. Movie. Now, on the last episode of Med vs. Movie, I broke down episode four as far as it could be broken down. I'm talking about like to the nitty gritty of this thing with pneumothoraces, talked a little bit about mental health in the emergency department, all kinds of crises that occur, and then even a little bit of fun stuff where your man got peed on. No R. Kelly. <laughs> No R. Kelly, yo. but in real life, man, I think that it's important for us to continue to see the different ways that these pathologies and different dynamics unfold in the emergency department. So let's go ahead and roll on to episode five. Now, if you aren't caught up by now, I mean, shoot, I don't know what you've been up to, but you got to go ahead and watch that thing. Pull back up here and we can talk about it. For those that don't care, you already know how I get down. Let's just keep this thing rolling, all right? Now, on this first case, it looks like my man is giving scut work. He he's, thinks he messed up earlier, so he got a case that seems like it's a little lower acuity, something that probably could roll through an urgent care. Let's see what happens. Coming downhill fast and jam my pedal into my leg. Ooh, ouch. That's cute. What about the center of the wound? <laughs> Gears up. Uh, Simple hematoma, which you can now debride. Now we go on biking trips. <laughs> Hold on, uh, no. Uh, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> do something, man! Oh, 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 no. This is oh, uh, I need a little help here. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> So let's get down to the science, man. I mean, the man's leg looks beat up. I'm talking about straight like road rash, a little bit of uh, hematomas formed at this tibia. And what I'm worried about here is not that it's just a standard, you know, blister that needs debriding, which is kind of why he approaches it this way. And as you can see, underneath that thing is an active vessel, just like surging and pumping. And he just clips, you know, part of that vessel and the result is a crystal geyser to your man's face. So I just think that part of this is really, really thinking about whether or not this is a blister or something different. Usually when I get cases like this, what I wanna do first is, is maybe even touch that area gently, put a hand on it. Sometimes you can put an ultrasound probe over it to see if there's like flow. Uh, that's because again, these areas can be just deceptive and everybody's anatomy uh, might be a little bit different. So that vessel could be closer to the surface than what we anticipate. Obviously right now, now is all hands on deck because he's actively bleeding in. The number one thing that you can do in the case of somebody having an arterial bleed is to put direct pressure on the wound, which is what he does. But then he screams, <laughs> I need a little help here. My man is panicking, yo. Hey, and now he got uh, arterial blood all pumper over his under face a blood blister. Like Let's see. Yeah. Oh, oh, geez. Okay. Oh. <laughs> noob. Right, noob. Exactly. C can you help me? Can you fix it? Oh, absolutely. Right. First, we are going to put this BP cuff on to stop the bleeding. <sighs> Little forward. Nice idea. I like that too. One of the best strategies in the emergency department is to take a manual blood pressure cuff and inflate, like hyperinflate it, so that you can stop blood flow. Put like a hemostat on the um, the tubing so that it's clamped, and then. From there, you can like you can absolutely evaluate that a little bit more effectively. She mentions that she's gonna give this gentleman a shot and essentially numb the area as well as constrict the vessels. What she's talking about is lidocaine with epi. You do like a 1% lido with, uh, with epi. Its whole job is to take those into the blood vessels and make them shrivel up a little bit. And that helps to slow the bleeding down at the actual site. Um, and, and so all of this I agree with. In fact, when we have arterial bleeds in uh, the ED, ones that are spurting like that, we're often thinking, can we do Lido with Epi real quick if it's an area that uh, won't be compromised for loss of blood flow. So are we letting down the cuff pressure until we can identify the exact spot? Uh, I see it, I see it, right, right there. Okay, now you can place a figure of eight suture. I've never done one of those before. <sighs> Look, maybe you should just do it. You should definitely do it. Whitaker's got this. It's easy. Just two sutures in one. Take a big bite, a simple interrupted suture, and tear it to the bleeder. Like I said, hyperinflate the cuff, make sure that the blood flow is completely stopped, and then you can appropriately uh, tie that wound off. And she, she talks about using a specific suture technique that I think is extremely effective. Salute and kudos to them for introducing this very early on. Dope for her to re affirm this man and to give him more confidence. 
what we need to talk about is how many pairs of scrubs this man is going through. <laughs> no man on earth should have this much access to scrubs. <laughs> it's wild, yo. So y'all know how I love procedures. In this next case, they do something that's pretty cool. Let's go ahead and check it out, all right? I'm 17, had a tonsillectomy 10 days ago at St. Michael's. Started spitting blood about an hour ago. Good vitals. Hey, Travis, I'm Dr. Robbie. How much blood? A couple mouthfuls. Can you open up for me? Hey, Whitaker, Jesse. Got a post tonsillectomy hemorrhage. Nebulize TXA, quick as you can. Let's go, right, trauma let's two. Go. Shout out to that. That's an excellent call out. So he mentions giving nebulized TXA as well as some basic labs that should be run right away uh, because this dude has uh, essentially a post-op complication. He's had a tonsillectomy, looks like he's still bleeding a little bit and maybe the sutures that were there ruptured significantly leading him or, or rather leading to the, the hemorrhage that you see here. Now TXA stands for transexamic acid uh, and this is one of the tools that we keep in our toolbox in emergency medicine that helps to clot things quickly. So we use TXA sometimes on, on topical wounds. Sometimes we use TXA uh, infusions or shots if we feel like there is a uh, massive hemorrhage. Like all of this is solidified. I'm talking about excellent emergency medicine call out here. In this particular case, he's gonna nebulize it, which is a cool way of distributing the TXA directly to the site where you see the wound. So rightfully it should appear like a different color once it touches those surfaces because it represents the clot formation. Okay. Head back, open wide for me. What do you see? Uh, no active bleeding, but there's some white and dark brown stuff where the tonsils used to be. Well, that's be. good. That's a fibrinous see? clot. That means the TXA is working. Mm -hmm. Your parents on the way? Ears, boy. They're in Baltimore. I swear. <laughs> when they hit the actual science, I always feel like, I feel affirmed. Because, like, saying the fibrinous clot, these are the things, the exact same ways that we approach it when we're teaching students, when we're teaching trainees. So, I love that they're using these exact same phrases. More for a wedding. I didn't want to bother them. Trust me, they're your parents, and you are in an emergency room. It's never a bother. Big Write facts. their numbers call down. The call the parents. <laughs> call head next. Stay with Don't them until they get here. Don't hesitate. Okay? Call their mamas. <laughs> call their daddies. Call them all. It's never a good idea to just like have a, a young person there and not. I guess at least get the information to call their parents. Usually I would ask social work if they're available to help kind of connect on these collateral elements. Let's try to tell them. He's on the phone with the surgeon and is like, hey, this guy's down here. He has like this post-op complication. He's bleeding. We can't necessarily stop the bleed. It's slow a little bit, but we want you to come down and check it out. And the surgeon is like, look, ain't my work. I ain't with it. <laughs> In reality, this, you know, sometimes happens. And so we have to kind of approach this with a degree of sensitivity. Uh, there's a bunch of legal reasons why sometimes they don't want to evaluate patients that they didn't do the operation on. But in some situations, we have to, as emergency physicians, advocate for the patient a little bit more, I would say, uh, emphatically to try to get them to come down. And that's what this medical student is learning, that maybe what you need to do is escalate to another person so that you get a proper consultation and evaluation of an actively bleeding patient. Now, for the ENT specialist, they might be like, yo, this dude's semi-stable. Did you try X, Y, and Z? I think all of that is fair. You should be going down the list of things that you can do to try to stop the bleed before getting the ENT specialist on board. Now, if you're not successful, that's the perfect time to say, hey, you need to come down from the OR and check this dude out. Okay, well, how am I supposed to send him back to St. Michael's? My man's got the yank hour holding it in you his mouth, trying to suction as much blood as possible. Hey, hello? Hello? What's wrong? They said it is not their job to fix another hospital's problem. Don't mm. worry about it, though. I'll talk to my attendants. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, damn. Ah. Exactly. <laughs> His reaction is my reaction is your reaction is our reactions. <laughs> First off, dog, the straight blood onto your body. By now, he should be wearing a mask. <laughs> My man is like literally a magnet for all things that are projectile. I don't get it. It only takes me one time. It takes him like five. Now, immediately I'm concerned. My man is spitting up blood on some straight exorcism level stuff. This is a problem. You gotta get him down now. 
So what I think happened here is they established some sort of clot with the TXA and maybe that clot ripped off, ruptured, whatever. Um, not that he actually like, you know, somehow manipulated the clot with the yank hour, but it was ineffective. And then you start to see him have an airway issue. Why is this an airway issue? Because a person who is actively bleeding is going from being stable to unstable now requires control of the airway. And what we do when we need to control the airway, we intubate, <laughs> we intubate y'all. Hold the blood bank, two units, hold blood, get a second line. Everything, the call outs are on point. You're thinking this dude is bleeding, I need blood now. So, the meds that he's using, I think are reasonably appropriate, ketamine. Hey, he wants the glide scope. This is uh, essentially a way to visualize the airway from a laryngoscope, not using direct visualization. All of this, I think, is appropriate. Hold suction. I'm going to try for direct pressure. If head and neck still won't come down, call Garcia. You're good, you're good. All right. So he mentions if head and neck won't come down. Uh, to call the surgeon and that's usually the default if you're not able to somehow stop the bleeding you call whoever the surgeon is in-house and they typically will come down and evaluate a patient who's unstable and hemorrhaging here's where it gets a little interesting all right watch closely what happened a bleeder opened up ketamine on board to intubate that's holding at 97 can you get an airway come on let's lie down keep pressure on the scale nothing but blood can't see the cords. This is like one of the messages that I send to all of my residents. Like, come get me. <laughs> come get me before it gets crazy. Like, once you think it start going a little bit weird, come get me immediately. This is terrible. This is like- Hold on, I'm going in blind with the bougie. I airways. might be able to feel the tracheal rings. And I might have a three-way with my- Pause. So he said he's gonna go in blind with the bougie and he might be able to feel the tracheal rings. What he's talking about is that angulated or that, that flexible rod uh, that you see that's blue. He's gonna try to manipulate that because he has no visualization, even with the video. Like he can't see the cords very well because it's active bleeding, right? So imagine trying to uh, basically hit a small, small aperture while it's being constantly filled up with red liquid, constantly filled up. And so that's what makes it difficult. You're suctioning as best as you can. As soon as you suction out, it fills right back up with red liquid. And so this man is gonna try to like navigate that in a way that he can basically like hit the top of the rings knowing that he's going in the right direction. I don't trust that. <laughs> Not my favorite thing to do, but let's see what happens. Donna, move. Not uh -uh. happening. Pressure. Right. Of course it's not happening, bro. You can't see nothing. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, hold on. We can try it. Relax, <laughs> dog. What? There's no obstruction. We just Here we go. see what we're doing. So we take a needle and we put it in the cricothyroid. We run the guide wire up and out the mouth and we slide the ET tube up over the wire. This is so cold, y'all. So a lot just happened. He audibled something that I think is like very indicative of how skilled he is as an attending on the show. Right? He talks about a retrograde intubation. Now, a retrograde intubation is an approach when you don't have a very clear uh, view from above, right? So you're looking inside of the mouth, whether there's a large GI bleed or there's kind of like some weird anatomy inside of the mouth or the tongue is very big and you can't directly visualize the, uh, the cords what you're gonna do try to go from below and he's saying the same place that you would you know do a crike you can access that area and then just feed a small wire through a, a tube or rather through a needle and then watch it come out of the top of the mouth once that wire comes out you pass a tube over that and use it almost to guide it directly into the right space. And you know it's in the right space because you've appropriately done the first part of the procedure, right? This is really cool because I think that in most cases, this is like last ditch effort or you do it before you actually completely do a crike. And so for him to think about this in this time is like appropriate, ballsy, but also salute because that it's a dope procedure. Team one before. So that's 90. No time to play MacGyver with this kid. Time to crank. Did it quick. 
He got one shot and then I cut. Right. <laughs> he wasn't like, all right, is what you want? <laughs> you cut? All right, let me cook. <laughs> Shoot. <laughs> let me cook, man. Okay, I'm in. Good work. Let me know when you start to feel it up top. All right. Yeah. So now you see well, so that he's got the needle, like this angiocath, okay. essentially, oh, right in, there. It's good. in the cricothyroid membrane. So that's he said he's in because he can feel Guys, air coming back. He second. takes uh, the Seldinger technique, uses it to pass the guide wire. He's using this technique specifically because he knows that the guide wire has a flexible J tip that's going to pass and navigate its way out the top of the mouth. So sometimes the wire gets coiled inside of the mouth because again, like I said, it's a, a flexible end of this uh, wire. Most of it, again, pretty straight, but as you push, that tip can kind of like go in any direction. It does not mean that it's always gonna go up the larynx and out of the mouth. And so he's above basically trying to suction and fish out that wire uh, and I think that they're just concerned that as he is continuing to decompensate, meaning like his sats are dropping, he's still actively bleeding, it may just need to be a surgical airway at this point. Excellent view of the cords, Dr. Mohan. I'm in. Inflate the balloon. Good breath sounds bilaterally. Sets 92 and raising. What's really cool is that they're contrasting a very controlled intubation and a disastrous intubation in the same sequence. And you may not catch that. The reason why they're doing the back and forth is because you can visualize on hers the perfect airway and then you go back to them and you see the most horrendous airway possible. <laughs> I like that, good, good pick up from the, the team that did the, the the different sequencing. That's really dope. Seeing it. I'm suctioning like crazy. Okay, we're done playing doctor. Lose the wire, I'm cracking this kid. All right, we tried. I'm sorry. No, wait, wait, I've got it. You still don't have an airway. Nope. The range is good in place and the tube All passes is easily. Bad. Pass the team, <laughs> the team tube over the wire. And, Come on. and the nick of time. that wire, and let go of that wire. Okay, good. Yup. Yeah. Place, yeah, we'll give you a little slice over the top. Yeah, yeah. But you gotta I feed the wire over the five yep. centimeters at the lips. Yeah, I'm about to do it. Pull the wire, bag him. Balloons up. Yellow on mm -hmm. CO2. That's good. That is Boom. very good. They're in. I love it. <laughs> good right. sounds about I only got one criticism of this entire section. When my man made the first pass <laughs> of that intubation, he didn't have a stylet. <laughs> he had no stylet inside of the tube. It's fine, you know, maybe it was just to get this one shot, but outside of that, flawless, flawless, flawless execution on all of these different parts, man. It's, it's really dope to see them elevate some of these sophisticated uh, last ditch effort techniques that we're taught uh, often, you know, to save somebody's life, specifically in these scenarios. So excellent, excellent usage of this retrograde intubation. If you're enjoying these breakdowns, make sure that you like, comment, and subscribe to Med vs. Movie. Every episode is getting more and more spicy, and I can't wait to talk to y'all about the next few episodes. Y'all come back. I promise you, I got this locked and loaded, all right? Until the next time, Dr. Brown signing out.